education classrooms to a sub-separate and inclusion classrooms. She's taught swimming since her high school years and has been working with a variety of ages in all different settings. She's worked with thousands of children, each with their own challenges and abilities. Janine's certifications include Adaptive Aquatics Instructor from the American Association of Physical Activity and Recreation, and she's an instructor trainer certifications from the Red Cross and YMCA. Currently, Janine is the Aquatic Director at Noble's Day Camp and Adaptive Swim Coordinator for the Charles River YMCA in Nina. So, and I'll give your full attention to Janine for the next 10 minutes in here, 15 minutes, then we'll move down to the pool. So, enjoy this presentation. I know that if you're reading, then. Good morning, everybody. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. And if you have any questions at any time, feel free. Shout them out and let me know. Um, awesome that you guys are doing this. This is wonderful. Every Saturday morning, good for you. So I'm talking about the pool and swim ideas, things you can do with kids with disabilities, really any kid in the pool. So first, I always have to start with drowning. Lead, secondly, because of death for the general typical population, zero to 14. Secondly, I think car crashes is the first. Kids on the spectrum, which, um, you may know, I know we've got lots of different majors in here, lots of different backgrounds. The highest incident of disability would be uh, autism, right? One in 48 or something like that. Children have autism, something crazy. They are 160 times more likely to drown than typically developing kids. Lots of reasons for that. In uh, no inhibition, impulse control, not understanding the risk factors, wandering, and no access to lessons or aquatic safety programs. So you guys are saving lives. We can extrapolate that from the autistic population to all kids with disabilities don't get the access to swim lessons and safety that typically developing parents have. So you guys are saving lives, honestly. The other thing I'll just throw in, you're gonna be able to do this job anywhere for the rest of your life. You, the demand for swim lessons, safety, aquatic safety, therapy, is huge. We can. I, I've worked at the buys for actually in the life, and the demand is growing, growing, growing. We can't meet it. You will be able to work at any buy, any indoor pool, all year long, summers. If you say, yeah, I can, I can work with any kid. So good for you. I do want to mention. Drowning does not look like it does in on TV, in the movies. It's silent, almost always, and it's fast. 20 to 60 seconds. When you're underwater, when you have the drown, it's a process. So water gets, you are submerged, immersed, Throat closes, you're not breathing, you can't tell. Your throat is involuntary closed, you're not getting oxygen to your brain. The longer you don't get oxygen to your brain, the more damage. Estimates are still, they haven't really nailed anything down, but for every one drowning, fatal drowning, there are five to ten non fatal drowning. There's no such thing, by the way, as near drowning, dry drowning. It's a process. You either have a fatal drowning or <coughs> non-fatal. Those non-fatal drownings can result in all kinds of long-term 
spray the damage. So, just be aware. Yes, you're saving lives, and you have to really watch your children and educate parents, caregivers. They need to watch their children always. That doesn't mean you could be sitting by the pool on your phone, well, especially kids with disabilities. Watch them. Okay. I think that's, anybody have any questions about that in the seriousness? All right, and I'll talk a little bit about keeping yourself safe. Safe. All right, so then if it's that dangerous, why do it? There are three really big reasons. First of all, you're saving lives because they do go to water. You can teach them habits. Come to the edge of the pool, stop ask permission. You can teach kids and parents when they come to any kind of aquatic venue, a pool, a beach, where are you, where is it safe to swim? Where's the lifeguard? What does the lifeguard do? Is he your helper? Is she there to, I have one kid who is terrified, like, oh, the lifeguard's here for you, it's, it's somebody. So teaching the kids to have that rapport, relationship and not be afraid of life anymore. Um, let's see. So layers, you're also teaching the parents that layers of protection, teaching the kids the safety skills. We'll go we'll right back and that's what we'll talk about in the pool. Among others, safety habits and teaching parents they need to watch their kids. There should always be barriers around pools, locked gates, high fences, kiddie pools even in the backyard should not be left unattended, those kinds of things, and learn CPR. Because if you do have to make a rescue, getting that oxygen to the brain is going to make a huge difference on us. Number two, the unique ther therapeutic qualities of the water are huge for everybody. I mean, that's why I keep doing it all these years. Some people may not be water people, it might not be your favorite, but my experience, the vast majority of even the kids who think they're not sure or they're really afraid, once they've learned how to be safe in the water, keep breath control, love the water. The texture, the motion, the, your buoyancy, different feeling, which is scary at first for many kids. But once you feel it, it's, it's glorious. It's a wonderful feeling. And, and kids who have sensory issues, so those sensory seekers, those kids who are always looking for input, those kids who are sensory avoiders, open your ears. And so a lot of times you'll have kids, people, who have, who may be sensory seekers tactily, but the noise bothers them. They're covering their ears. The pool addresses it all. Kids want that motion and the splashing, breaking the surface tension when you splash or jump. Kids who like to have it quiet and be it's, it's the sound you can still hear in the water, but it's, it's much more. The hydrostatic pressure of water, you know, that, has anybody ever swung deep and how you feel it in your ear? That is called hydrostatic pressure. It's, gives your body a hug. Those kids who like that deep pressure, who like to squeeze, who like to feel that um, tightness, the water does that for them. So that's one, one of the tips that I always find helps many kids who are really scared and nervous. I hold them, just give them a hug, and I get them to their neck. Sometimes that takes a little bit and again, if they're nervous, they're not going to want to do it by themselves. I hold on to them, but getting a kid to their neck 
keeping their face out so they can breathe. But totally submerge that helps. So all of those properties are calming, but also stimulating at the same time. Think about when you when you learn best, maybe not Saturday morning, so he's just talking at you. But you need to be alert, but you can't be crazy. And you can't be falling asleep. The water really is able to help individuals be alert, but calm, organized, center. And lots of parents have reported this last. They love having swimming. I have to lots of kids that love having swimming at night. And that night's sleep is so much better. The whole night is much calmer because they have their sensory. Um, say something else about that, carry over. It's also because they like it and it feels good, it's also very rewarding. So they will work for whatever it is. Uh, I, I understand we have some speech and language pathologists here, and there are some big studies going on with speech and language in the pool because the kids can focus and be organized. And they'll work if you know, all right, work whatever task you're doing, and then they can play or they can kick or just being in the water, they're much more receptive. Okay. Then the third really important thing, of course, you guys, this is the physical, what's it called? Clinical, uh, what do you call this? It's city children's physical development lab. Children's physical development lab. So being in the water is the best exercise, really, for the rest of your life. I work with with 90 plus ladies, mostly like, actually I don't know. I do it our friends stretch and swim thing. But because of the nature of water, it's better on your joints. The resistance, no matter which way you're moving, you're moving your muscles. You know, here, gravity is pulling my leg down. In the water, I have to use my muscle to pull it up and pull it down. Any way you move. So it's a lifelong exercise and recreation. Playing in the water is so fun. The kids will love it. And it builds that socialization. Gives, gives a space for kids to be social. To, even if it's parallel play, you guys learn about that. So maybe we're not interacting yet, but we're at least next to each other. And it builds that space for it. What else? All right, we talked, I told you too much more about that. So self-esteem, of course. And we talk about how to help the kids be successful. And I'm telling you, that's, and this is actually what it's down to for me for decades, thousands of kids, because they feel so good about themselves. Oh my God, look what I did. I've had the, the most terrified kids who won't put their face in, and they go home and say, Mama, I moved my arms. You know, they, they talk about the things, the little teeny things maybe, that they learned in swimming and how good they feel about themselves. Um, yeah, any questions about that stuff? So you're saving lives, you're teaching the kids how to be safe. That's why we have swim lessons or aquatic programs. The therapeutic properties are, are unmatched, obviously, anywhere, in any other kind of a setting. And the kids can do this for the rest of their lives and have an inroad to socialization. And you guys will be able to teach two hours a week, no matter what else you're doing, if you would like to pass.
much you want to volunteer at a Y, guaranteed. Okay, let's um, I'll bring some, we'll pass these out. So I'm handing out um, just some quick tips that I'm thinking of the top of my head. Not an exhaustive list. Of course, that's the beauty of working with kids, uh, especially kids who have disabilities. You, the ideas, the things you can do, the things they need are as unique as each individual kid, right? But one of the things I stress, you never want a child to come to the water and jump in. You want them to stop, ask permission. I have lots of kids who are nonverbal, and eye contact is their thing, but I get in their face and they have to point. I have some picture schedules or some, some other visuals. Sometimes they have to. <laughs> Brendan, he finally can put his two words together. Get in. He just kept saying, in, in, in. But he yeah, can put the two words together. He say, get in now. And he's so excited. Again, that's not working for, because he wants to be in. He knows he can't get there until he puts those two words together. But I always make all kids ask. I have some kids. Shy or, or whatever. Charlotte is just grouchy sometimes. So I, Charlotte, do you want, can I get on the bus? Can I have lunch? And we have to go through all these silly things before she say, Can I get on the Teach the kids about where deep end is and shallow end is. We better hurry up, huh? <laughs> um, so listen for stock. I don't know how many mobile kids you have. And impulsivity, teach them to stop. I practice that. Walk, 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 stop. Yeah, you did it, you stopped. Even though it's easy. And eventually, but you play a game. A game out of it, but the stop means stop. And that, for me, I find in the pool, don't run, don't do that, don't do that. Stop. Don't swim away, stay in the pool, stop as always. Um, so there are some more. If you're in a beach, there'll be a little bit different rules. If you have a kid who is impulsive and runs, if you have a kid, you know, so you'll think of, you'll have your own. Really, swimming is being able to have breath control. Huge. That's the biggest part, I think. Mostly, for most kids, breath control. Practice blowing outside the pool. Whistles, obnoxious things really help. Blowing in a straw, you know, kids get the idea of exhaling really fast. I don't do that with them. I tell the parents to do that at home. Um, so breath control, buoyancy, being comfortable with your feet off the bottom, being able to slow to relax, stay still. That's tricky for a lot of kids. And then swimming, everything from just moving your arms and feet to actually doing strokes, developing into strokes. You want it to be safe, you need to be able to change your direction. Turn around, turn back to the wall, horizontal, vertical, horizontal. And then getting out, climbing out of the side of the pool, and your pool is really hard. But kids should practice that to the best of their ability. You should, everybody should be able, if you're in a pool, you should be able to climb out if the ladder is too far or whatever. Um, so, and then some strategies, set expectations. I'm going to show you some of my rules. Use a picture schedule and count down to transitions. I have a, so in the pool, I find Visual, auditory, all of them, you know, they need both. I use my hands. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, great, it's all done. Um, of course, positive, positive, positive. That doesn't mean you can't correct, but it, it's always positive. And 
working with these guys, I mean, personally, I don't know how it came out. Um, and you're breaking down the skills, that's what I'll try to help you with in the pool. Understanding their sensory needs, they need to jump around, they need a break, they need to go underwater for a few, minutes, a few seconds, or be under and come up. But let them have those choices, always. Do you want to start on your tummy or your back? Not always, but throwing in choices, I would say. If we're kicking now, you can kick on your stomach or your back. Sometimes the choice is, do you want me to help you get out, or do you want to get out by yourself? Swimming is all done. There's the choice. Or sometimes, all right, what do you want to do now? Or what toy do you want to put? But giving them choices, giving them some power and ownership. And equipment and toys, there you go. Those are always fun. I just have threw in some helpful searches there. I think you guys are probably much better at that stuff than I am looking for what you need online. But um, the Red Cross Go Nike 1981 is really weird. I don't know where that comes from, but those are all the strokes if anybody ever wants to know exactly how to do the front row, where your arm is supposed to be, how the body position, the timing. That's I think those those videos are great. They're are some other ones in there. Angel fish, has anybody ever heard of um, angel fish swim? Swim angel fish, whatever. Aileen, I don't know, these two women, I think they're out of Connecticut. They have a huge presence now for teaching mostly kids with autism, like t teaching swimming to kids with disabilities. They have all kinds of trainings, it's ridiculously expensive. You've got to keep paying money to keep your certification personally. I think it's a lot, but they have a lot of videos and stuff. They have one on equipment and, I don't know, fun stuff. Okay. Any questions? All right. Let's get down to the pool. A lot of the flotation that we use for learning to swim or therapy or play. Even, even you guys use these are awesome. Some people we call I call these bubbles. And I like the kind that have slices you can take off. So as they get stronger, these flotation aids are not life jackets. They are wonderful for learning to swim. People who say, oh, don't use a bubble, they'll get um, used to it. They, they you know, they, uh, what's that wording? Of course, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Uh, it'll come to me. They'll, they'll depend on them. They, you should use them to practice swimming, but take them off. They're children. They are supposed to have it be, oh, I can't think of that word. They're going to depend on you. They should. You should be within arm's reach when they're using these. Uh, puddle jumpers, these are the new things. These are Coast Guard approved life jackets. I have read stories where kids still have drowned using these. But a Coast Guard approved life jacket has the um, stamp on the inside. It'll tell you the rate, the weight, and who's it's, what population it's good for. Parents should know if you're going in a boat, if you're at the beach where you can't be right next to your child, if you have a lot of kids up that there's working, that you're watching, life jackets. Learning to swim individually with parents or in a, in a lesson, these things, okay? Just a quick aside. Um, where's all my stuff? So first, I like to set the expectations, and this really is good 
for all children, but particularly kids with disabilities, and particularly in inclusion groups too. If you're working at camp and you have all kids with all kinds of challenges, strengths, set expectations. So those are those are rules, right? And they don't have to be big and long and complicated. Do you guys ever use social stories? A lot of kids who have any kind of anxiety, a lot of kids who like to know, many kids on the spectrum need to have a routine and a schedule. So I have social stories. Um, I always ask a grown up before I get in the pool. I don't run, I pee in the toilet before I get in. So this is a good one. A lot of times I give to parents before. I'll let you guys pass them around. Another couple of them, you can see they're all here. Stay in the pool, don't run. I laminate them. They don't last forever. I have a couple different ones. Don't hold your friends in the water. I teach in so many places where the water is um, over their head, and when they hold on to each other, if they're in a group, they both go under. If they have bubbles on or something. And this has it's just a few different examples. And I often post this one right wherever my station is. I found um, medical tape works over and over, but I'll put that right where people, where the kids can see, and sometimes, you know, don't forget, I point, or if they're nonverbal, they point. But I have the sign, can I get in the water? I always make them ask that. So I set expectations. Then I have schedule, I'm gonna hold on to this one. Give you these. I have various schedules that I can use, various ways. I'll let you pass those around to you guys. Just to look at, um, we're gonna do this, then this, then this, then that. For a lot of my kids, can you guys see this? You can look at them after too. They are just a picture. This is a picture of a kid doing a bob. And I Velcro it. If any of you guys, uh, does anybody use picture schedules for any of your classes or anything? I did it backwards. I have this soft, fuzzy stuff on the thing and the rough on this. Generally, you do it the other way, but I did it wrong first. And so now all my stuff is. It's really a small little detail, it doesn't really matter. Set. So I have the, the skills we'll be doing. And then depending, sometimes I have, there's a clock I need a break on the back, or I have one child who likes to scream. He's happy and having fun, but he just has a very loud vocalization. So I have quiet voice just for a reminder. Um, I'll give up. This is some other pictures. Just an example of various skills or toys or reminders that I use. And when I have a bigger class or this is just one of those plastic signs, lawn sign. And these are just, um, well, that's Low, it will just stick. So we'll blow bubbles, then we'll do yeah. I almost always do that kick with your face in. So if I have a small room or I whatever, you can do it that way. <clears throat> um, some more. This one I use a lot. Stop. Wait. Can I get another? That helps sometimes stop weight on here. Okay.
And then, <clears throat> so I set the expectations, here are the rules. I don't go over them every single class with every single student. They, once they know them, generally they know them. It depends on, it all depends on the kid, actually. But, so they know what's expected. That's calming and relaxing. It, 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 think of it as yourself. If you don't know what you're supposed to be doing or what the rules of this situation are, it's anxiety for them. So this helps them. Here's what we're going to work on. Also, that helps me stay focused and know where I'm going. <clears throat> and then the third thing, I have this uh, countdown transitions. This helps kids, especially with disabilities, but, but really almost all kids, anxious kids, the levels of anxiety of kids today in general. I don't know if you keep hearing. Knowing, okay, this is going to be done in this time, and we're going to move to something else. So this is a visual. All right, in five, we're going to start jumps. And you can take them off. For me in the pool, this gets too cumbersome. I often say, all right, we're going to have a break. Take a break. Break's all done in 10. 10 seconds, 10. OK, five, four, three, two, one. And I probably am jinxing it, but all of my kids now, I've got 20 or so I'm teaching this session. Okay, they know that's the end. They put the toy down or whatever. They get ready for the next thing on the schedule. All right, any questions or does anybody need to see anything else? We good there? What, do you know what the full temperature is? Um, the thermometer always says 80. It's not 80, but... 80, 80. 80's, 80's Yeah. <laughs> For, I, I'll just throw this out here, especially since it's going to be taped. All the literature on teaching, up from Red Cross, YMCA, teaching children to swim, all the literature on teaching kids with disabilities to swim, 87 is probably optimal. College pools are never going to be. Get in the 
yourself wet or having somebody else get you wet. Spray toys. I, I, my 13 year olds love this thing. Everyone does. It's really cool. Some kids don't want it on their face. I let them play with it. Just to get used to. Sometimes it's to get into the water. Sometimes it's a break tool. They just want, they just love doing that. Feeling the water, stopping it going. This is, these are really cheap, relatively speaking. And they last forever. They have noise. In a lot of ways, these things, these are wonderful. For the, for the price. Okay. And this one. I use, okay, two. I found this, um, I shop at um, TJ Maxx a lot, or Job Lot, or, you know, cheap whenever I'm, I do have a problem <laughs> shopping for toys still. But I found this bath toy. Lives on hands. This is the way you wash your hands, wash your hands. And then your turn. I forgot your name. Kara. Kara. Feet. Wash your feet. So then we wash our feet. And then your turn. Belly. This is the way we wash our belly. Any kind of, you know, just to play, to get used to the water, comfortable being in the water, putting your face down in, get putting your ear in, because they can still breathe but getting that cheek wet. Lots of kids will do that. If they won't put their eyes in, but they'll get their face wet, they'll feel. And slowly you can work that in. Another thing that's really weird that works like magic, wipe your face. So you use your hands. And then I have them get more scoop. Now I'm wipe your face. <laughs> you guys are making me get wet, I'm sorry. With it, just the pressure and get it once you once you are already wet then that that's why having warm water the warm the closer the temperature of the water is to your skin temperature thermal neutral the easier it is for you to get wet when this is cold and your skin is hot you're feeling that difference and that's not comfortable and can be Again, anxiety provoking. Okay, so we blew bubbles. I, what I'm working towards is rhythmic breathing. So you're blowing bubbles, putting your face in, controlling your breath. Now you're going to, do you guys really not want to work? I know you've got the whole day and have it soaking my hair. But what I would do is have them, if they're putting their face in, even some, actually, some kids who won't get their whole eye wet, but blow and jump. Blow and jump. So they're doing it rhythmically and they're still moving because you want to keep them moving. standing in the water is freezing. You don't want them standing doing nothing, which is happening. Then, so then, all right, Karen, bubbles are all done. Once, if they're doing bubbles and jump, they go under and jump all the way under. Bobs are a great way to splash, to get used to the water, to warm up, to practice that rhythmic breathing, controlling your breath, exhaling when you want to, inhaling when you need to. So, bubbles are all done. So I would say you can take that off. See, all right, turn it off. Now we know we're, we're going down the list. I throw it on the side, or sometimes I have enough on the back. But, okay, so what's next, Emma? Kicking. kicking. So for kicking, I use kickboards. Yeah. Or, do you guys have some here? Uh, noodles, barbells, any kind of, and then there were some kids that, okay. so <laughs> some kids I'm holding. Underneath here, you want them to feel that um, streamline, horizontal, right? <laughs> or 
So, Kara, we're doing kicking. Ignore this part right now. Kara keeps letting go with the kickboard. Hold kickboard. I'm going to hold her hands while we kick down. I actually, I mean, yeah, there are a few kids who can swim fine down or swim, do the mermaid swim, but holding on and building up that muscle, leg muscle, what you're working towards for kicking is, let's try it again, because I, I show, but I can't talk at show. All right, kick, horizontal. She's kicking from the hip, loose, floppy feet in the middle. <laughs> Loose floppy feet. All right, go back. Show them kicking from your knee, bending the knee a lot. Even more. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. You know, you should kick. I know it's a tiny kick, <laughs> but lots of kids will kick like this, and then you'll also see kids who are have a egg beatery or breaststroke kick. At first, you want them to move and feel comfortable, but for a proper flutter kick. It comes from the hip, knees are loose, but basically straight, and ankles are loose. The power comes from kicking with the bottom of your foot like down, okay? So that's kicking. For moving your arms, I generally, so I, for my lesson, I have them warm up with Bob's breath control. Then we kick. Maybe if they're not quite there, they move on the train. I have one little boy who loves a train, and so after each thing, train is his reward. Okay, 10 more seconds of train, and then it's the next thing. But I try to alternate really big muscle moving, like kicking, and stationary skills. So then, kicking's all done, Kara. What's next? Superman glide, so some kids just point some Superman glide. And I teach them the language so that they know what's what. You need to be able to be streamlined. Stream, everybody knows streamlined, right? A fish, an airplane. That's how you need to move in the water. If you're vertical, it's hard to move through. If you're horizontal, you streamlined, you slide easier. The whole point of swimming is to use the least amount of energy, the least amount of effort to get you the furthest. So being streamlined. So we practice Superman. Ah, uh, these I love. Kids love these. Um, Lifeguardstore.com has these. Nordstrom, Nordesco, I don't know. They're not cheap, I think it's like $15 a pair, but they're really fun. The kids love them, they come in two different sizes. So, all right, I'm gonna pretend you're at the end just so everybody can see. I, if they're holding on to this, they have a little, it's fun, and their hands are together in a streamline, and I can hold on. Now I can just pull, all right, ready, boom, five, four, three, two, one, blast off, blow bubbles, I want to put a face in, so I'm going to be encouraging that. Some kids, like it's no summer, need to help them keep their legs up horizontal. But this is just one of those, I can drag them. All right, now Emma can try it by herself because she's really doing awesome. And if she puts her face in, she'll do it better. You know. When you have your head up, <clears throat> if you're trying to be horizontal and your head is up, your legs go down. When you put your chin down on your stomach, when you're prone, and you put your chin down, <clears throat> you will stay horizontal. But your face has to be on the water, you have to be holding your breath, but you will be on top of the water. <clears throat> Conversely, if you're on your back, if you put your chin up, you will stay horizontal. Some of the, once you're getting into adolescence and older, mainly boys, but also some young women too. Your neutral buoyancy can be, you, you won't be neutrally buoyant, you'll be negatively buoyant. So it's hard for you to do a back fold, so you have to do, adjust your body position. <clears throat> but 
if you, like, for instance, if you bend your knees, put your arms over your head, put your fingers up like this, so you guys who usually sink, you muscle boys, <clears throat> uh, you can stay on your back. Take a big breath, hold it in your lungs, and talk to the kids about balloons. Does a balloon float or sink? Your lungs are like balloons, fill them with air, that will help you float. Okay. Um, but also, I want to say about Superman was. If you guys have questions, please. I know I'm just like throwing stuff at you quick. Oh, we don't have too much more time. Okay, so that's a quick. We did Superman last off. All right, okay. I have some kind of a picture for swimming. A lot of my kids now I'm working with side breathing and arms out of the water. You can use noodles are great for um, giving a little bit of, well, this is a good, this is a good size. Noodles are all kinds of jumping out from the top. But, so they, it can help, they can hold up, I'm sure you guys have been doing this. Reaching and pulling. Some kids, I talk about simultaneous, use that word, hold the blanket, or, um, alternating. Either way to start, front crawl is the same thing as freestyle. These, you know, swimmers, laps, uh, competitive swimming, they call it freestyle. But it's front crawl is the stroke that freestylers do. It's alternating arms with flutter kick. Noodles are good for that. Bubbles. And again, you want them, I put them on their back. I like them lower to keep their hips up as much as possible, keep them horizontal. Lots of kids will start by some horses. <clears throat> and as they get stronger and better with breath control, put your chin in the water, blow your bubbles, reach, 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 you're getting them to be horizontal. But if they're, if they are, vertical and they're running, that will, if they keep swimming and you keep encouraging or reaching out and you practice streamline in other situations with the new, with the kickboards, with the round things, holding them, they will eventually, that, that bicycle kick is from the hip so it will stretch out to a uh, good flutter as they get stronger. My, my rule of thumb, if they're choking and can't keep their head up, then I add a, a slice. If they can take a breath, even if they're struggling, because I'm right there, I'm within arms, it's not a lift up. Uh, they should be struggling. They have to be able to move to keep themselves up. Otherwise, you're really just kind of playing and flipping. But those are good, bigger kids. These. And I have, I've got a, one of my guys, he's 13 now, hemiplegia, um, partial paralysis on his left side, issues with mobility, issues with balance. And so when he's not, even though he's been swimming for a while, he can't keep himself up. He can't take a breath without a flotation if he's over his head. So we use this, but we still do laps. You know, and I, but I don't leave it on the whole time. We do some feeling what it's like under the water. Okay. Barbells, you can put your arms over. Barbells are much more sturdy, give you a lot more solid but um, they're not as easy for arms. <clears throat> but they're good. I think using lots of different things gets the kids to feel their bodies and their, their um, you know, how to move through the water in lots of different ways. Okay. We're talking a lot more. Um, if anybody has kids who 
I'll quickly say, let me see, did I bring them all? Oh, I drew up my pumpkin on this one. So, here, you're already swimming. She can swim, but I'm trying to get that reach. So, Kara, touch the ball. <laughs> you know what? So, having them reach out to something, even for me to see I'm either walking backwards or treading and, and just having a little tap that's getting that extension and the pull. Pull down to your pocket, pull down to your leg, big arms, doing it out on the land, out in the air, and then in the water. Little guys, I do dig, dig, dig. I was talking about Clifford and they didn't know who that was. <laughs> Clifford the Big Red Dog, you guys are a little young for that one. <laughs> yeah. Now they're talking about pound puppies, which I'm not up to my preschool TV anymore. So, but any kind of thing like that, that you know that they like. Play, play, play. <laughs> um, so then for getting them to swim, getting them to want to move, I have Foam puzzles. Ones with fewer pieces are probably better for, but I throw pieces out and then they have to swim and then maybe they, they put it on a kickboard or something. One piece at a time, two pieces. Maybe two kids can work together, getting that socialization. If you guys have any time, I don't know how much you encourage that, but I think that's, those are really fun games. M and most kids really dig that. They have fun with that. But yeah, grab one piece. I have um, letters you can use, your speech pathologists use easy sounds, d d d, find the d, hard sounds that you want them to practice. <laughs> you know, whatever, their name, whatever, but those, so these ones I have, again, it's a puzzle. Find the negative or the positive space, whichever, you know, the inside or the outside. I have those, oh, and I have these little puzzles. This came in a package, you guys, um, I don't know, they were like four or five. Transportation, there's just four pieces. Throw those. So think about any kind of toy that may or may, you know, may not necessarily be made for the pool. That still, you know, our waterproof network, those are so fun. But those kept throwing them out, swimming to it, having them swim to something. A lot of times. If they're if they're nervous or they you know they don't want to, it's very motivating. They don't realize they're swimming, they're playing instead. Make sense? Um, back floats again. I love these. I can, this is a little bit more advanced. At first, <laughs> at first. So so this is startling, right? This is comforting. Kids who are afraid are gonna do this. Kids who even will get their ear in, a lot of times they'll in the pike position, do you know that? When you push your bum, when you bend, you're flexing at the waist. That's pike. Even on their back, they'll push their bum down. Push your belly up, push your belly up. What you're working towards is ears in the water, chin up to the sky, and chest out. Sometimes having their arms out will help a lot of kids. Most preschoolers are neutrally buoyant, and if they stay still, they will float. And a lot of school age, but as you're getting into school age, then it gets a little bit. So, at first, I'm not, I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. It's, swimming, teaching swimming, it really is physical. So, you're gonna put your head on my shoulder. She's got something solid to put her head on. I'm gonna get your hair on. And if her chin was up, 
I'm gonna go down, down, down till she freaks and then come up a little. I go down to freak out. <gasps> okay, it's all right. Your ears are gonna tickle your, it's gonna tickle your, you know, whatever. Or as they do that, then that. Sometimes I can pull their head. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And as they're looking at me, putting their chin up. What's on the ceiling? You see the monkeys on the ceiling. Uh, you know, whatever. Then the other part of that is, okay, we're gonna do it for this amount of time. ABCs is one I always use. Okay, let's sing our ABCs. A hey, beat on the back. They love singing ABCs. And they know it's for this time, and then it's gonna be done. What do you want to count to? I have some kids, I wanna to count to 50, because, you know, they like to, even though they don't wanna be on their back. Or, I wanna to count to two. And as I'm holding them and their back going, two, that's two more. How about six? Okay, six, we'll count to six. And you can count one, two, three, four, five, six, and you can count one, two, depending on their comfort level and how much. And as they get more comfortable, as they trust you, that's a huge thing. Did I put that on our, I can't believe I didn't even say this before, <laughs> building trust and rapport. I'm sure that we've talked about this. Particularly important in the pool because it really is scary. Build that trust and rapport. Say what you mean, do what you say. I won't let you go, don't let them go. Or don't say it. So always follow through with whatever you say. Let, you have to build that trust. You have to build that rapport. They have to like you and want to please you. And they will. You've, you've seen that, right, already? They love you. And they want to please you. And they want to do what you want them to. So if you make it fun, positive, always. All right, we're almost done, huh? Okay, um, back quotes. All right, I'll just show you a couple more things and then we'll be done because I know you gotta get going. I found these cool things. Happy water bottles. I found these a couple weeks ago. They're my new favorite. The water bottles. <laughs> oh, sorry. They. It's disappeared. They're, you fill them and um, over and over. They have a little magnet. The kids love these. Any kind of diving toys are always good. Things that necessarily may not, like I said, may not be good for the pool. They love this, this guy sinks. Getting them to look at stuff on the bottom, dive for stuff. I have a lot of kids who really have a thing about twirling. It's their stem. So I found these, they sink, they twirl. They twirl slow so you can dive for them. Do you guys see? Um, do you guys have poly spots in the gym? Or are you putting them in the pool? They sink something to look at, even if they're not diving. Do even doing it gradually, putting them on the steps. So even if they don't have to reach, have to put their face into reach, encourage them. Getting, getting that face in and feeling comfortable being underwater as much as well as the moving through. All right. Okay, um, my last thing I will tell you, anybody please come and look at that stuff if you'd like. If you think of a question after, let me know. Um, keeping yourselves safe, if you should always have some kind of piece of equipment with you, especially if you're going in deep water. Uh, you Keeping yourself up in deep water is obviously much easier than even having a three-year-old hold on to your neck and keeping yourself up. So a piece of equipment is always good. If you are comfortable in the deep water in the first place. Egg beater, treading, can everybody see me? I'll try to do it on my hands. This is really a great, efficient kick. I can move. 
to use my hands, but it takes little energy, the least amount of energy to keep yourself up, and you can maybe if you're strong enough, help a kid move, hold them, and a kid grabs you, hold your breath, go under. They will let go. You have a lifeguard, you have other people. Don't try to pick a kid up in the deep end. That doesn't work. Drag them with a new keep the piece of equipment between you and the child. Because some, some of your kids are really big. They're not babies. So keeping a piece of equipment and keeping it between. But if somebody does grab onto you, do you guys know this? Go underwater. Take a good breath, go underwater, swim away. And reach. Reach and throw, don't go. Have you ever heard that? It's a big thing in the Red Cross. We teach the kids that. Never go in to save somebody unless you're a trained lifeguard. Okay, we need to go. Okay, kids are yep, kids are coming. <laughs> All right, if anybody has any other questions, let me know. Thank you.